It is January the 25th, 2021, and <laughs> this is Curiously Polar. Good morning, Henry. How are you today? I'm great. Good morning to you. How about you? Uh, pff, the same. It's a it's a Monday. We are usually recording on Mondays, and Mondays are fun days. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay. Um, another episode of Curiously Polar with... Um, let's kick this off with a bit of news again. I think that's kind of an... It's, it's a nice intro to the episode before we talk about the main topic. Talk about some news. And uh, we have a few things prepared here. Um, the first is an earthquake. There was an earthquake, a pretty big one. In the Antarctic. It was actually, yes. Uh, Saturday evening, local time, I think uh, shortly before midnight. Uh, local time, it was 8.30 p.m. And um, uh, yeah, GMT, it was 8.30 um, around that. Mm -hmm. And earthquake was 6.9 magnitude. That's already Whoops. quite something. Yeah, that's already uh, initially they said 7.0. Here's a, here's a tweet by Christoph Grützner mm -hmm. from Switzerland. Um, and then later, I think they corrected it to 6.9. So here is a website. We put, yeah, we'll put all these links in the show notes. There are like um, a, a number of um, of, of seismic uh, agencies who are actually tracking earthquakes, and they all have different uh, measurings. And the I think the average was 6.9, uh, what uh, was agreed on. Um, the two leading ones are actually the U.S. Geological Survey and the Geo Geoforschungszentrum, um, the Earth Science, and, um, Science Institute in Potsdam in uh, Germany, and both of them are qualified as 6.9. That's a pretty and big earthquake. earthquake. It, it is, it is. It's actually quite shaky. So if you would have that in a big city, you would probably see some um, significant cracks in houses. That's already something you would be rather scared of. But luckily that happened in an area where there is A, almost no population or uh, inhabitation, and B, not much business right now thanks to uh, the pandemic. Right. And the actual um, earthquake happened around 55 kilometers south of Elephant Island. So it's closer to the South Shetland Islands than it is to the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, if you listening um, on the podcast, just hop over to, to YouTube and you just see a map of the US Geological Survey where you actually have really just uh, the epicenter, um, which is right um, south of Elephant Island. Yeah, and, and by the way, the, the links the are in the show notes. So if you want to follow this without the video, uh, just look in the description. That's, you can find everything. That's there. true. The only reason why we actually got note of that is because the government of Chile, which also detected that uh, earthquake, issued a warning, an automatic warning um, that was just sent to all um, mobile phones, basically. And because it was a earthquake that happened in the sea, they were expecting a tsunami. Because oh, so. is, that, is that the is that the global global tsunami warning system that kicked in there? No, I think it's not the global one. I think that's really uh, locally um, uh, Shalinian there. Okay, but they just did the math uh, earthquake of magnitude seven, and in um, in in the water in, on a, on the ocean floor, it was actually quite shallow, only ten kilometers um, below the mm. sea, which is if you have a seventy kilometers. Um, crust on average, then it's actually quite close to the surface. And usually in, the, in that area, we're talking about a depth of 35 to 40 kilometers where the earthquakes happen, if earthquakes happen there. And um, the issued warning actually caused quite some panic in Chile. And it uh, yeah, forced the, the government to actually um, to apologize later on because they figured later that it is an Antarctica. It has no real deal for Chile, particularly not for the northern parts of Chile. So there was no no real impact. The only impact it had was for research stations in the area because it is actually quite close to King George Island uh, and the South Shetland Islands, which is kind of the the epicenter for uh, for research and also the gate for the Shalinian um, science 
stations because there is uh, an airfield at the Eduardo Fry um, station um, which links uh, Punta Arenas, for example, in uh, Chile to the South Shetland Islands and brings in uh, scientists. Um, I heard that there has been an evacuation of the staff just very briefly, so they actually uh, went into higher grounds but I uh, couldn't find any information if there had been um, some tsunami going on or not. But we have actually a rather active area there and rather active in a geological uh, perspective. It's not really that we have earthquakes there every day, but if you consider the entire of Antarctica, then we have more activity there. And it's simply because we are at the edge of a number of microplates there. So we have really a number of um, elements coming together. We have a lot of friction of traction going on there. And every now and then that's released um, with earthquakes and sometimes even um, due to volcanic activity, just naming Deception Island and the southern part of the South Shetland Islands. All right. of that coming together is just pretty, the, the earthquake happened pretty close at the uh, edge of the Shackleton Fracture Zone and the Bransfield Basin. So it's actually the, the beginning of the Bransfield Strait where that happened. And uh, that's just where one plate dives under the other. So we have two microplates interacting here. And for a long, long time, that microplate that actually um, dives under the, um, uh, the, the South Shetland plate was considered to be inactive. And those earthquakes show there still is some activity. So the plate is still moving, even though it's very, very slowly. Okay. Second piece of news um, is a crack has formed. What kind of a crack and where? We are talking about the Brunt ice shelf and... Our uh, dear listeners will probably recall that name. We already talked about that in episode 113 from November 24. And we talked about the Halley Research Station, about the, the emperor penguin colony that disappeared and relocated. And there we talked about briefly about the Brunt Ice Shelf and also the relocation of the Halley Research Station. And the relocation was necessary because... Uh, the Halloween crack formed and we have the Chasm 1 crack that also formed. So we have two cracks that actually go perpendicular through the Brunt Ice Shelf. And now a new crack formed in a tremendous speed here. And uh, that's uh, north of the Halloween crack. And it just, yeah, just goes pa quite parallel to the Halloween crack. It just uh, diverts north now. And scientists are waiting for those big chunks of ice breaking off since 2019 but in january when this last picture was just um yeah just uh, retrieved scientists are now quite sure it's happening very very soon just because of the velocity speed of the ice so the ice shelf remember um, origins from land-based ice masses from glaciers coming down from the mountains and um yeah, extending onto the sea but because of the motion of the ice, we have naturally formed cracks. And then, of course, if we have then uh, ocean currents underneath and we have different glaciers forming that ice shelf, they also have different um, speeds of, uh, just of moving forward. So all of those factors coming together and creating cracks. And then we have this geological formation, the uh, McDonald ice rumbles, which, which is an, um, a subsurface formation. It's like um, a sea mount in, in the ocean, a mountain basically underwater where the ice shelf just runs aground. And then you have the ice streams on both sides just moving very, very quickly and the ice rumbles holding it back. So there, there's a natural uh, yeah, friction zone where cracks happen. And now especially on the Brunt ice shelf, there's only a very, very small piece. And in the video, you can see the, the tiny little red square. That's the last remaining connection what? here. Um, that is nothing. That keeps the, exactly. <laughs> that is literally nothing. And you also can see the dot of um, the new position of the Halley um, Research Station. Yeah. The Halley Research Station is unmanned because the, the British Antarctic Survey is actually expecting the Brunt ice shelf to not disintegrate, but at least to carve some significant icebergs, uh, both 
roughly the same size, 1,500 square kilometers each. But we have just a, a, a tiny party of uh, technicians that have been um, sent to Halley to do some maintenance that's necessary in the research station. It's not fully automatic. So they need to do some, um, some maintenance there. And for them, that this is just a very tricky time right now, just waiting for the ice to crack. So we hope sincerely that they um, just finish their maintenance uh, and, and can just go back home um, before that remaining connection actually cracks open and diverts the, the first iceberg. Okay, dokie. That is some, um, yeah, that is a bit scary. So if that, if that new crack gets even larger and this this lodges a big chunk of ice from from the shelf how big would that chunk be it's also roughly 1500 square kilometers so in the map we have um, in the video here you have beautiful different colors it looks like so it looks like a rainbow ice shelf um and on the southern part you have berg one that's the the big one um that was threatening the old position of the halley research station so halley was actually um, you can see the dot right next to the one of Berg 1. That's where the old um, position of the research station um, used to be. And this is something um, scientists are waiting for two years now to break off. But very, very recently in December, they actually discovered the crack in the north where you have this um, white triangle and, uh, which, which turns into um, pink in the north called Berg 2. And you can see where this white and the pink area are just um, colliding. That's where the crack formed. Pink, and you pink, see is, the, the pink, pink is like three three or more meters per day at uh, movement, exactly. according to the legend on the right. That's the, the second highest velocity here. The white is the, the, farthest, uh, the, 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 the fastest velocity here. So it means it's the biggest speed of, of ice uh, rushing down, traveling. And when you see how that is um, distributed onto the entire ice shelf, you see there's a huge difference. It's a much, much slower section on um, the Brunt ice shelf and a much bitter on the Stancombe Wills ice shelf, which are both connected. And you see that the both Halloween crack and the new crack are actually um, protruding into the Stancombe Wills ice shelf and will break off a significant part there. All right. Well, another thing to keep an eye on. And uh, let's move on to the third piece of news. And that is, uh, well, j j just us showing you, no, pointing towards something um, which is interesting. So there's this clothing company, uh, I think in London, they make Antarctic or Arctic clothing, especially for these very cold climates. Um, this is not a paid advertisement for them, but they have, um, of course, been hit by COVID as many other businesses because um, for the expeditions don't really happen right now. So um, they have just started a series of uh, talks, of talks by really interesting people. So um, what is this about? Antarctica Now, that's what it's called. Exactly. So the company uh, Shackleton is based on um, yeah, polar expedition experience and expertise. And since we can't travel uh, due to COVID, um, the founders of that brand just decided to bring Antarctica home and just pursue a little bit um, the question, why does the Antarctic matter to all of us? And by that, uh, by that, they actually just came up with the idea of a seven-day online fe uh, festival, which um, is kind of celebrating this um, extraordinary continent. And it brings us experts like Klaus Dotz, um, professor of uh, geopolitics at the Royal Holloway uh, University in London, um, Mark Drinkwater, the hat of the European Space Agency's Earth and Mission Science Division, um, Dr. Mackenzie Greenman, an ice core, uh, ice core research specialist in Cambridge, um, the polar explorer and photographer um, Sebastian Copeland, um, Lizzie oh, with Daly, nice camera wildlife biologist. The He's got a beautiful <laughs> little panoramic camera. Sorry, I'm a nerd when it comes to film photography, and that is a Linhoff uh, panoramic camera. Sorry, go go on, continue, please. No, it's 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 uh, it's awesome. <laughs> um, Lizzie Daly, who is like a wildlife biologist, a broadcaster, and a conservation filmmaker, 
uh, Hugh Broughton of um, Hugh Broughton Architects. He's one of the minds behind the Halley 6 research station and Stephen Jones, expedition manager and uh, of Antarctic Logistics it's and Expeditions. And last but not least, Louis Rutt. That's the last one. Record ranking Paul Adventurer and expedition leader. So you see, it's really interesting... Um, uh, speakers so I'm, I'm really curious about the talks it's it's going pretty much everywhere um it's it's a very nice a uh, virtual jo- uh, journey that takes us a little bit in that um lockdown um to this amazing continent and um, i'm just right. really looking forward interesting and i uh, we, we have looked before the before recording we've had a quick look and to see if they have an archive of these somewhere um, we couldn't find anything, but I hope they will make these available for uh, viewers later on. So um, I guess we'll link to that page where these are on. And hopefully, if you listen to this after this whole series is over, um, you might possibly be able to see them here. Um, we're talking like here's the 25th, then it's the 26th, 27th. So, so they're really like, they are really... Um, they're really uh, banging those out in rapid succession here so it might be too late for yes. some of you to watch those but um yeah i sure hope they will have an archive if not well you're on their website so just uh ask them i think it's probably the easiest good find really good find i'm really happy about this and it um, brings us to our to our actual topic it just brings us um from like not being able to travel to Antarctica, but still um, pursuing uh, science and scientific research in Antarctica, it just questions how is that possible? And it's mainly possible through scientific um, data that already exists or just recent satellite data. And sometimes you have this moment when you sit in front of a satellite data and you have pretty much no clue what this is about. And then some mysteries just arise. And so it happened that there even aliens reached the seventh continent um, when a picture just <laughs> emerged and showing some formation over mountains in Antarctica. And suddenly it was a big spread that there might be some UFOs um, hovering over the seventh continent, particularly the Eisenhower range of Antarctica's Transantarctic mountains. In the end, it just it got explained. It's just clouds that actually just forms kind of hallmarks of uh, lenticular clouds it's and actually just form when wind with high speed rivers <laughs> <laughs> and just rises on those mountains and they got hit by other um, uh, wind in, in, in the other directions and just forms those clouds by that and they're constantly forming even though it looks a little bit like they're not moving at all they're constantly forming and uh, disintegrating at the yeah. same time uh, as, a, as a photographer with a, a couple of photography podcasts i get asked a lot of questions about visual phenomena and yes some of those are definitely down to um down to uh, things regarding cloud formations but also like weird light reflections inside lenses and so on and i can i can clearly say this is not aliens this is clouds yeah of course aliens would probably looks disguise themselves like... as clouds i would think yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah light is since um independence day we know they always emerge from clouds so that's probably where all this fuss is about Particularly when you uh, see the shades, it looks pretty much like a UFO to me. Uh, I don't think it looks like a UFO. No, it doesn't. Um. <laughs> exactly. You have just other pictures coming up. And I heard a lot of rumors and just very recently picked up by British media that the picture we can see in the in the video right now it looks a little bit like an impact on the ice and there were some rumors going on that there might have something crash landed and just skated on the ice and has just you left this uh track behind it and when you see the story of the area this was discovered in which is at the foot of mount erebus then you actually can relate a little bit to it if you remember the um, your plane accident at Mount Erebus, uh, New Zealand Flight 901 that crashed into Mount Erebus in the 70s, I think it was. And I think it was episode 73 where we 
tackle that. I'm not precisely sure at this very moment. So when you put this all together, then you can understand that um, where the source of that mystery comes from. But if you look a little closer on that picture, you can see that there are formations in that picture and all of those formations like cast shadows. So that also gives you an idea that the formation we are talking about, it looks a little bit like a saw, like the, the, the blade of a saw, that this formation is just not in the ground, it's not in the ice, it's above the ice. It casts a shadow of this long dawn, which is very popular in um, in that area during um, spring and autumn, where you have uh, pretty much close to the polar night, um, prior and, and, and after the polar night, where you have this deep standing uh, sun casting those long shadows. And there has been words that this has been a mystery for scientists for a long, long time. This is actually not true. <laughs> and if we hop over to Google Maps and just go to Mount Erebus, to the Ross Island, then you actually see there is Cape Avins, which is this um, little peninsula at the south of Ross Island. And if you zoom in into that triangle at this, that bay, then you see there is this thing, this feature, already existing on Google Maps. So it can't be that new since we all know that the Google Maps satellite photography is not just exchanged daily. So you can see something like that and you can also see that it's coming from land. It actually originates from a glacier at the foot of, of Mount Erebus and this glacier is just pushing onto the ice and it's actually like a mini shelf ice, if you like. It's called an ice tongue. And by the way, and interesting thing you can see there, here. Let, let me interrupt you for a second here, because what you see here in the Google Maps data yeah, sure. is the, the way Google Maps works is that it has uh, those photos in so-called tiles. So there are like different pieces of the screen coming from several photos and it stitches them together in real time and what you can see here is that some of these tiles are from different time frames so um, you can kind of get a bit of a time travel here with uh, these little ice pieces breaking off so google maps is 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 kind of revealing what it's doing here by uh, showing you that uh, yeah that this does not look like a crash landing does it but it's, it's also different seasons here. We see on the right side, uh, it's yeah. all in white. So it's sea ice there. So that's winter. And then on the left side, you see two uh, frames from, from summer um, where you have no sea ice around that ice tongue any longer. But smaller debris is just br uh, breaking off. It's carving from the ice tongue. And you see the edges, they look very sharp. They look very edgy. Um, that's because we have still a quite rough sea there so the, the sea is just banging against the the ice tongue and it's just cutting into it and then of course co uh, causing some carving here along the way so this is just not new but if you see a satellite picture from from winter where everything is just white and you have this one thin line particular a close-up of that it might give you an idea of an impact site but the mystery here has never really been a mystery since this feature has already been described since Robert F. Scott's discovery expedition, which happened between 1901 and 1904. So it's very, very little mystery here, but an amazing feature, really something particularly special. Those ice tongues, pretty awesome. And it really looks kind yeah. of artificial, doesn't it? Yes, there's there's a, an area of photography um, in there as well. Uh, so from from people flying over that, and you can see actually this, the three small islands in uh, in the distance, it, surrounded by sea ice. So that's a winter picture, as you can see, and you see the ice tongue. It doesn't look like an impact um, site at all. There is no trench formed by something big hitting the ice and just sliding or skating on the ice. It really looks like waves of ice pushing out onto the sea into the bay here this this makes it kind of obvious that we're not looking at a crash landing site that we're looking at a feature that raises up above and has uh, more of a flowing characteristic i would think but this gives you also a little bit the idea of 
how how uh, important it is to reveal other sources of the same um, site and just have a different look, a different angle at the same site because the picture we just uh, featured in the very beginning, which raised that question of if that's an impact sign, is a very particular time of the year when the impact sign actually shines very blue, when you have this blue crisp ice and which looks completely different from the surrounding area. But if you look from different angles, from different areas, this mystery is just gone very, very quickly. All right. I, I think that, yeah, that's the big lesson from this episode. Don't trust just one source and do your research. Today, it is possible to do your research. There's so much information out there. You just have to track it down and it's easier than ever to find all these things. So, um, yeah, I think that's something we learned from today that a glacier tongue can look like a alien crash landing if you are... Um, if, if you tend to go these directions when you see things, but the reality is quite a different one. Um, that concludes this episode of Curiously Polar. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for um, being subscribed. I think that's kind of the cool thing. If you're a subscriber to the podcast, you will find us, of course, wherever you find other podcasts. We're online at Curiously Polar on the interwebs. We are on curiouslyporter.com with all the previous episodes. And yeah, stay tuned for, for more interesting things. Thanks for being here. And we'll be back pretty soon with more. Till then, take care.